So we will start. Good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ashot Markarian, and on behalf of the UCL Armenian Society, I am pleased to welcome you to this important event. I would like to thank Lewis Foundation for supporting us in all our initiatives at UCL. And special thanks to CivilNet for making this event available online via their channel. Um, the topic of our seminar is Nagorno-Karabakh and security in the South Caucasus. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished guest speakers who accepted our invitation and are here with us to discuss this important issue over the conflict which still goes on in one of the most vulnerable regions. Um, I would like to begin with our first speaker, Mr. Vahan Ovanisyan, who has held many positions within the Armenian Republic. Among those, the following must be mentioned. He was a member of the Central Committee of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation and later got promoted to the IRF Bureau. <coughs> Here it is worth mentioning that IRF is one of the oldest Armenian political parties and a member of Socialist International. Mr. Ovanishan served as an advisor to the President of the Republic of Armenia and was the head of the Commission on Issues of Local Self-Government. He was twice elected as a Vice President of the National Assembly in 2003 and 2007, respectively. And in 2012, he was elected Deputy of the National Assembly by the Proportional Electoral System from the IRF. Our second speaker, Felix Khachatrian. Uh, Mr. Khachatrian was the third secretary of the Nagorno-Karabakh <coughs> Ministry of Foreign Affairs Political Department and head of the Ankar MFA Policy Planning Division from 2001 to 2004. Mr. Khachatrian was the advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs between 2006 and 2008. He also served as the head of the Ankar MFA Division of Analysis and Planning and since 2012, Felix Khachetrian serves as the Deputy Minister of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic Foreign Affairs. And finally, the last speaker is uh, Dr. Richard Giragosian. Dr. Giragosian is the founding director of the Regional Studies Center, which is an independent and a well-known think tank located in Yerevan, Armenia. He also serves as both a visiting professor and senior expert at the Yerevan State University's Center for European Studies and is a contributing analyst for Oxford Analytica, which is a London-based global analysis and advisory firm. And finally, uh, we are proud to have one of the most prominent and professional academicians who will chair this event. A week ago, we were celebrating the 25th anniversary of his hard work as a senior lecturer at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Dear guests, I am with great pleasure introducing you, Dr. Pete Duncan, who will chair the event. Thank you very much. <laughs> so without further ado, I've, uh, I'm, I feel great honor to be invited to chair this meeting. Thank you to the UCLU Armenian Society and to all of you who have come. Um, I would like to go straight on, please to uh, uh, Mr. Vahan Afghanistan, please. Thank you. And I've asked the speakers to speak for between uh, no more than 15 minutes, but not necessarily the full 15 minutes, so we can have as much discussion <coughs> as possible. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you young compatriots, uh, speaking about 25 years of the independent struggle in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh war, as a part of that struggle, we have to understand that Armenia fell under Soviet rule after fierce resisting. It is a legion that Armenia or other uh, republics of Southern Caucasus uh, became voluntarily part of Soviet system. It is not so. The only country which uh, became Sovietic voluntarily, uh, gladly, was Azerbaijan, because uh, by doing that, they uh, resolved, or uh, that, that they seemed to think that they resolved their problems with neighbors. 
especially us and Armenia, being divided between Turkish uh, newly emerging Kemalist Republic and Soviet Russia, uh, had the same fate as Eastern Europe under molotov ribbentrop Pact. Our country was divided between two dictators. Uh, but neither of them was later punished like Hitler, so we remained in the same situation until Karabakh struggle started uh, exactly 25 years ago. Uh, it took long time, of course, uh, to understand that the approach of both sides, uh, both sides were uh, were in a way <coughs> not very effective, if we can put it so. Azerbaijanis tried to resolve the problem by force. Armenians responded by force and uh, seemingly seemingly uh, normal development, aggression, response, war and uh, ceasefire are today from the perspective of uh, almost 20 years past after the that uh, signature on the document of armistice uh, now we understood fully where our mistakes uh, were uh, it will be of course not correct from my side speak only about Azerbaijani mistakes but from our side we always uh, felt ourselves defending those who defend themselves uh, not necessarily see their mistakes uh, because they always can imagine that they were forced to do that mistake but that, that does not mean that we uh, are not going to uh, change our attitude and improve this there is a saying that you no know, uh, between democracies there cannot be war. Democracies never fight to each other. Maybe it is somewhat primitive <coughs> approach, but we have to understand that if nevertheless such fight occurred, happened, so maybe some of the participant is not so democratic after all. And of course we see that Azerbaijan today is a medieval emirate with uh, inheritance of power from father to son and so on. But can we be so sure that Armenia is full democracy? I think no, it is not so. So uh, there, is, uh, there is a final resolution of the conflict is, I think, lies, I think, only on the roads of democratization of the countries and uh, implementing international as well as uh, internal laws fully, democratic constitutions, elections, civil society, and human rights. If such situation will emerge in our countries, the way to the resolving of the conflict will be much easier. <coughs> because today, what we have today? We have today clash of principles, which uh, of course took us uh, the, up till now and is taking us nowhere. One side, Armenian side, says Self-determination is the most important principle. Azerbaijani side says no, territorial integrity is much 
more important. And that's nonsense, of course, because neither in international law nor in any kind of law uh, or legal system cannot be <coughs> more important and less important laws. They simply work in different fields. If self-determination works in the field where the nation is feeling itself, feels itself so oppressed that no other way out is uh, only rebellion and secession, territorial integrity works when two sovereign states uh, speak to each other, have relations. No state can occupy or annex or uh, take the territory of other state. But these are, are different principles. Why artificially we have always the clash of these principles? Because we don't see under the, uh, I don't know, in, in Russian it sounds very good, we don't see the forest behind the trees. We see only victory. Azerbaijani won't uh, want victory, Armenians of course also, but we don't see the forest behind these trees. The forest it is uh, ultimate victory for all, which is historical reconciliation of all the region, which is not only Azeris and Armenian, which is also Georgians, Iranians, Iranian Azerbaijanis, peoples of South, uh, Northern Caucasus, Abkhazians, Ossetians, Turks, Turkey, and Russia. So it's a wider uh, picture that can resolve these problems. And not only competing which principle is more uh, right, which principle can gain more approval from the big countries, big powers, and so on. So I think you, as a young generation, as the uh, serious duty and task, make our country more flexible, more democratic, and more open towards uh, world trends, and then we can resolve this uh, conflict without new action. <coughs> Of course, I have much to say, many things, uh, but we have no time, and I hope uh, I will have an opportunity to do that, answering your questions. Thank you. Please, Mr. Fay, it's back in you, just round it as you wish. There's your phone there. Thank you. I will from here. Can you hear? Is it okay if I move the presentation from here, or is it better from there? There is a microphone there, so not here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for, for, this, for the opportunity to meet with you and to speak about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, yeah, it, it, the, the, the roots of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, conflict uh, go back to the history, at least, uh, to the beginning of the 20th century, the period of the collapse of the Russian Empire. But uh, I will confine my presentation speaking about the modern period, starting from the 1988. Uh, 25 years ago, the people of Nagorno-Karabakh declared their intention to exercise its, their right to self-determination as a reaction to the decades of oppression and discrimination. Their struggle for civil rights, national dignity, economic equality, cultural identity, education on the native language became the embodiment of the spontaneous protest against injustice. Uh, it is necessary to mention that the struggle for rights has not stopped since the decision made by the Soviet authorities to transfer Nagorno-Karabakh under the control of Soviet Azerbaijan in 19, 1921. But it became really wide scale in 1988 when embraced the civil and political will, intellectual and creative potential, physical and spiritual power of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. It was an unprecedented and truly democratic movement in the former Soviet Union. We got united around the struggle for our existence in the 21st century, our right to have future. 
In spite of the peaceful and legitimate nature of those manifestations in Nagorno-Karabakh, from the very beginning, Azerbaijan rejected political dialogue and resorted to the language of intimidation and threats, <coughs> and pursued the policy of the violent oppression of the free will of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. And the Armenian population of, uh, the, Azeri, uh, of the Azeri city of Sungaik, located several, kilo, several hundred kilometers from Nagorno-Karabakh, became the, one of the first victims of Azerbaijan's policy of terror aimed at the Armenians of Karabakh. Throughout three days, upon the silent agreement of the authorities and complete inaction of the law enforcement agencies, people were murdered, raped, and maimed for the mere reason of being Armenian. The pogroms were stopped by the Soviet troops, which were sent to Sungai three days later. Soviet authorities who blocked journalists from the area reported that as a result of the pogroms, over 30 people were killed and 200 injured. While some sources estimated that the number of murdered Armenians is more than 100. It is worth mentioning that almost 300 soldiers were injured restoring order in Sungai, and this fact speaks for themselves about the real scale of the atrocities in Sungai. And silencing the truth about Sungai tragedy uh, and the impunity granted to its masterminds paved the way for ethnic cleansing throughout Azerbaijan. It reached its climax during the bloody massacres and mass deportation of Armenians of Baku in January 1990, and which later led to a full-scale military aggression against the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. During the war, it was Azerbaijan who, which, which escalated in hostilities using the new types of weapons such as multiple launch rocket systems and combat aircraft, <coughs> aircraft against the civilians and repeatedly broke already concluded armistice. The war has taken thousands of lives and left deep wounds in every Artsakh family. As a result of hostilities, the economy of Nagorno-Karabakh was crippled. Its infrastructure was completely destroyed. More than 50% of the territory of the Ankara still remains under Azerbaijan occupation. But the people of Nagorno-Karabakh withstood the imposed war. In 1994, the ceasefire agreement was reached to which Karabakh was a signatory. Uh, that is when it became possible to focus on building democratic and lawful statehood. Karabakh has passed the exam of war and is passing the exam of peace. We, we had to rebuild our destroyed homes to ensure the transition to market economy, restore infrastructure, and improve the people's well-being. Despite all the challenges imposed by the historic legacy and tough neighborhood, the Republic's economy has enjoyed a steady growth which positively reflects on our people's living standards. Today we can state with confidence that we do have certain achievements in building statehood on the basis of democratic values. Free, fair, and transparent and competitive elections have become an inseparable part of our political culture. Since 1991, we have already held five presidential, five parliamentary, and as many local administration elections in our republic. Our political transition has always been legally and orderly. <coughs> All the elections, including the most recent presidential election of July 2012, were assessed by international observers, foreign parliamentary members, journalists, and public figures from 22 countries as free and transparent. And even though Nagorno-Karabakh is an unrecognized state and may not undertake commitment to observe the universal democratic standards before international organizations, but it's steadfast in following them. Moreover, the human rights record in our republic is significantly higher than many recognized states, which was reflected in the last Freedom House report. However, the most acute issues that need to be addressed remain the settlement of the conflict between Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. We are confident that effective negotiations require restoration of the Karabakh's immediate participation at the all stages of the negotiation process. From the, exchange, from the exchange of opinion on philosophy of the settlements to the uh, discussion of the practical steps and the implementation. <coughs> the, rest <coughs> the restoration of the entire participation in the negotiation process is a necessary condition to reach the final settlement of the conflict and establish lasting peace in the region. And it, it should, it's worth mentioning that uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh as a party to the conflict is reflected in the Budapest Summit document, of the OEC Budapest Summit document, which directly referred to the 
signatories of the ceasefire agreement of May 1994. We have consistently been committed to the peaceful settlement of the conflict and we also joined to the appeals of the international community to prepare pe people for peace, <coughs> not war. Unfortunately, we are still far from the final settlement of the conflict. Azerbaijan refused to implement the commitments within the negotiations under the auspices of the OEC co-chairs of the Minsk Group. Azerbaijan has been effectively rejected the repeated proposals by the international community concerning the consolidation of the ceasefire agreement and strengthening, strengthening the confidence building measures, such as withdrawal of snipers from the line of contact, investigation of ceasefire violation, and, and, and so on. Moreover, the belligerent rhetoric and threat to unleash another war uttered by Azerbaijan have intensified and the number of ceasefire violations increased, continuing to cause human losses. The lack in the progress of the negotiation process is neither the fault of the mediators nor the deficiency in the um, format of the co-chairmanship, as our neighbors often try to present. It is the fault of those who torpedo the process and distort the logic of peaceful negotiations. It is the fault of those who repress any voices for reconciliation, as it happened with the famous Azerbaijan writer Akram Arisli. It is the fault of those who propagate xenophobia and hate, hatred by promoting, pardon, promoting and glorifying as a national hero and role model for youth, as a perpetrator of a hate crime who had beheaded a fellow Armenian student with an ax when he was asleep. It is the fault of those who declare all Armenians of the world the number one enemy of Azerbaijan. Meanwhile, our enemy is not a certain state or nation, but xenophobia, which is being implanted in the might of young Azerbaijanis. Our enemies are zealous hatred and intolerance, as well as the dreams of some people to wipe Karabakh over the world map. Unfortunately, this is the security environment we live in today. So, our nation and the international mediator must deal with the, the threats, threats with utmost seriousness. That is why we believe that a stronger and unequivocal reaction from the international community to Azerbaijan destructive stance could ultimately decrease tensions and facilitate a climate that is more conducive to peace. In recent years, the awareness and developments worldwide have come to prove that imp implementation of the right of people to self-determination is the most effective way to resolve international disputes. And this inspires us, inspires us to overcome all the hardship on our path to the logical outcome of the Karabakh conflict. The initiative around the globe in support of Nagorno-Karabakh's right to self-determination, such as the resolution adopted in uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, in Australia, New South Wales, and creation of the Friendship Circle in France and the Parliamentary Friendship Group in the Lithuanian Parliament, point out the stressing trends of prevalence of universal values of human rights. And we believe that the current international status of, of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic should not be a barrier for international cooperation. Moreover, ignoring the fundamental rights of our people can be and often is interpreted in, a, in Baku as a <coughs> indirect support to its policy of imposing a, a collective punishment to the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. We believe that unimpeded involvement of the Empire in international processes would not only ensure implementation of the concept of equal and comprehensive security based on our shared values, but it would also send an appropriate message to Azerbaijan to abandon its revanchist aspiration and demonstrate political will for the sake of a stable and productive South Caucasus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could now have please Dr. Richard uh, Garagasian. I'm usually not so much of a conformist, but I will use the podium. <laughs> but good evening. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the organizers, especially thank you to the Armenian Society of UCL and <coughs> Dr. Duncan for actually joining us. Now, most of all, let me thank you for coming on a very cold evening in London. For this reason, I'm only going to present three specific trends or developments in terms of regional security. The idea being we want to provoke and promote as much discussion and insight. Because for each of us, we didn't come here to just speak. We came here to listen and learn as much. 
And for this reason, let me begin with actually the title of tonight's event, Nagorno-Karabakh, Security in the South Caucasus. Let me begin with a basic explanation of why Nagorno-Karabakh. What is it? Why is it significant? Before getting to regional insecurity. In many ways, Nagorno-Karabakh is significant in terms of what it not is any longer. In other words, Nagorno-Karabakh is no longer really a frozen conflict within a former Soviet space. In many ways, it is increasingly hot. We have increasing tension. We have mounting and escalating attacks, violations of an informal ceasefire. In many ways, Nagorno-Karabakh, if it ever was a frozen conflict, is surely cracking in terms of melting. And what it's also about is it's not really a conflict between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. It's more properly a conflict that is now serving as an arena of competition among great power players, Turkey, Iran, the Russian Federation, even the United States and the European Union. The UK, obviously, because of British Petroleum, has a specific agenda and unique interest, but in a general Western <coughs> context, Nagorno-Karabakh is really punching above its weight. It represents significantly more in terms of not only a threat to regional security and stability, but more importantly, representing the collision or competition <coughs> among competing interests of greater powers. What's also important, if we look to the second half of the title, the regional security, in fact, I would argue it should be amended to read regional insecurity. And there are three specific trends now underway, where in terms of regional security, we have a virtual arms race. In fact, it's a repeat of a Cold War style, American-Soviet arms race, where Azerbaijan is spending billions of dollars I'm sorry, I'm American. It's a lot of pounds, I should have said. Um, but in many ways is leading an arms race in terms of devoting increasing amounts of resources and investment to defense spending. Armenia and Karabakh, for their parts, are compelled to keep pace. The reason this is particularly destabilizing is not just for the military implications of procurement of more offensive weapon systems. But more deeply, it's a generational deficit, where these decisions taken today affect generations to come in terms of not only mounting tension, unresolved conflict, but for every increase in defense spending represents a matching decrease in investments in education in social spending, in health care, especially in education. In other words, the one investment for the future of these countries in the region are being neglected for the sake of more arms. In the case of the South Caucasus, to be honest, it's boys with toys. It, it's the procurement of increasingly more deadly and more offensive weapon systems with more of a temptation to actually use these arms. The second trend beyond the arms race is a shifting balance of power, where Armenia currently is militarily the stronger power. Ironically, from a military security perspective, however, Armenia's advantage or power is based on a defensive advantage, where Armenia actually poses no threat to Azerbaijan or to others in the region. Ironically, its defensive position also means that Armenia has in many ways graduated to a new state of being a contributor and no longer just a consumer of regional and international security. What's also interesting, though, is the deeper threat. The deeper threat to Armenia, to Nagorno-Karabakh and to Azerbaijan, is increasingly internal as much as external. The threats are actually isolation, where borders never reopen, and the region is never able to reintegrate. But more than isolation is also the threat of insignificance, 
where much of the world moves on without caring anymore about Armenia, Azerbaijan, or Nagorno-Karabakh. These dual threats of isolation and insignificance are the real imperatives for why we need to actually engage in conflict transformation at this point. And it brings me to the second trend, the peace process. It's not very much of a process, and it's not really that peaceful either. In many ways, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, has a virtual monopoly on mediating and diplomatically engaged in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Whether we like the OSCE or not, as an institutional actor, it's clear that without the required political will on both sides at the same time, the conflict is very unlikely to be resolved. The second inherent flaw in mediation, in terms of applying a political science or international security approach, is that unlike Northern Ireland, unlike the Troubles, unlike the Palestinian-Israeli issue, Nagorno-Karabakh is the most direct party to the conflict, yet is excluded from the peace process. In other words, for years the Israelis refused to negotiate with the PLO. Only when it, when it did choose to engage the PLO could some sort of progress be attained. The other concrete example is the Good Friday Accord. In other words, once the UK engaged the IRA, only then could a real degree of progress be attained. In terms of Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia still exercises a virtual monopoly on negotiating on behalf of Nagorno-Karabakh. Azerbaijan, for its part, refuses to directly engage or even acknowledge Nagorno-Karabakh. Inherently, this is flawed. What we also see is, in many ways right now, Armenia, unfortunately, has no partner for peace. We don't have someone on the other side of the negotiating table. In many ways, my criticism of Azerbaijan is much more specific. Its diplomatic strategy is neither diplomatic nor very strategic. It's maximalist. Its opening position in negotiations is the same as its closing position, all or nothing. This is a demonstration or an affirmation that the two sides simply remain too far apart. Therefore, one approach may be to actually try to refreeze and limit and contain the threat of war over Nagorno-Karabakh <coughs> while building greater democracy in the parties to the conflict. At the same time, we need to recognize and even reward the fact that Nagorno-Karabakh has much stronger democratic credentials than, than Azerbaijan, but even more than Armenia. This needs to be rewarded and built upon. What we also see, looking at Armenia, Armenian foreign policy over the past several years is in a much stronger position. But ironically, the strength or success of Armenian foreign policy has largely been a result of the mistakes of rivals. Missteps and mistakes by Turkey and Azerbaijan have benefited Armenia. These diplomatic dividends are normal and acceptable. But what Armenia needs to do to sustain this advantage is actually be much more proactive, much more prudent and forward-looking, and have much more of a strategic vision. And, in many ways, it's also about numbers, not defense spending, but in terms of 21 years. We have now 21 years have gone by in terms of this unresolved conflict in the peace process. What we need to remember is excuses no longer should be accepted. Bad behavior shouldn't be rewarded. States that act like spoiled children after 21 years should be punished and no longer tolerated. In other words, the countries of the region have reached the age of maturity and there should be no more excuses for bad behavior. And we need to hold everyone, including Armenia, to a higher standard and to account whatever the nature of the governments and the countries. What we also see is the real danger in this last trend. 
the danger of renewed hostilities, which is a diplomatically polite way to say the danger of war. But regarding Nagorno-Karabakh or regional insecurity, there is little likelihood and even less danger that Azerbaijan will declare war against Nagorno-Karabakh or Armenia. The more realistic risk, and this is a region at risk, is the threat of war by accident, based on threat misperception and miscalculation, where both sides stumble into war because of overreaction, where skirmishes and attacks spiral out of control. Finally, in conclusion, it's important to note that there is no conclusion. It's far too premature. It's also an imperative that in order to reach conclusion, we need to start engaging in more constructive dialogue and regional reality needs to be recognized. On the one hand, Armenia needs to be held to a higher account <coughs> of more democracy, <coughs> more economic development, but also more statesmanship. <coughs> and in the region, there's a big difference between ruling the country and governing the country. And we have far too many strong men instead of statesmen. And we have far too few stateswomen for that matter. But finally, what we also need to focus on is actually us, civil society, students, experts, professionals. We need to actually challenge the unacceptable status quo. He's from Nagorno-Karabakh, the deputy foreign minister. If I was from Baku, I would pretend he doesn't exist. But he's not a ghost. This is the land of Harry Potter, but there are limits to our imagination. We need to be more realistic, but also we need to be more mature and to each other. Thank you. And thank you all those excellent speeches. Excellent speakers. Um, I've been asked to, um, what's the phrase, uh, sum up a bit uh, before we go to questions. So let's make some summing up remarks at this stage. I, I certainly don't want to repeat what the uh, speakers have said. I'll follow their example and go to the uh, podium. Um, but I would like to say, <laughs> can you hear me now, the, the, uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah good. Um, I, I just did a few things I'd like to, to add, if I may. Um, I think it was uh, Dr. Gergasian who talked about Nagorno Karabakh punching above its, weight, above its weight. I want to make an important point here, I think, that this is the UCL Armenian Society. But Nagorno-Karabakh has, has, for the last 25 years, been much more important than something in Armenia or in Azerbaijan. It was, as um, uh, when, the doc, the, when um, Mr. Hachatarian, sorry, Hachatarian, I have to forgive my pronunciation, Felix, um, said uh, uh, that uh, we talked about the Sungait massacre. Um, I remember doing an interview for the BBC in 1988. And correspondents often like you to come out with some really big, outstanding statements. And in response to the massacre, um, there had been a demonstration in Yerevan in 1988 of a million people. And I was asked, is this the most important thing that's happened in the Soviet Union? And I thought for a minute, I said, yes, this is the most important thing that's happened in the Soviet Union. A million people turning it out. That, there was no other precedent, no other comparable mass action of a million people throughout the whole Soviet Union when, um, in that period. And to me, and to a, a lot of other people who've written about this, um, the inability of Moscow to, to deal with the problem at that stage was a big signal to those people in those republics like the Baltic States and Georgia who could see that uh, Moscow could no longer uh, maintain its control. And that was a major factor in bringing about the end of the Soviet Union. So please don't think you're dealing with a, a small problem in a corner that isn't, uh, isn't very important. This is a, a matter of world historical importance. Um, the, uh, um, Mr. Havansian um, made the point about democratic peace. I, I think it is generally the case that uh, countries which are democratic, which are democracies, are established democracies, don't fight each other. You, it's very hard for you to find cases of countries that really are democracies that fight each other. Um, 
and um, several of the speakers, I think all the speakers actually made the point that one of the things that's necessary is the democratization of both Azerbaijan and Armenia. And the OSC has been very critical about election practices in both those countries. But the, there is a problem, I think, with this approach, that it's the process of democratization itself that can be, can be dangerous. Um, Jack Snyder's done work on this in relation to uh, the former Soviet Republic and other, other conflicts in Yugoslavia as well. That when people have been repressed um, under regimes for a time, and then they get a, a, a chance for democracy, then their demands can escalate quite substantially. Um, and so it could be a danger that the democratization, we shouldn't think of it as a, as a panacea for everything immediately. It's necessary in the long term. But I think uh, Dr. Uh, Giragassian was right when he said that Aliyev is not going to attack the... Uh, Azerbaijan is not going to attack Armenia. They're far too conservative to do that. But if Armenia was to democratise, um, and uh, given, given the feelings of pressure that, they, that have been there in Armenia through the Soviet period <coughs> and the... Uh, the uh, and in the last 20 years of poverty, of blockade, um, I think the danger might be that more extreme demands might come about. For example, the desire to not just to uh, recognize <coughs> Nagorno-Karabakh, but to actually um, annex Nagorno-Karabakh, to see it as part of Armenia. On the other side, democratization in Azerbaijan, I think, uh, given the, uh, the propaganda that has been fed to them <coughs> over the years, including the last <coughs> years of the century as well, um, about the, but in particular over the last, uh, the period since 1994, about the occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh. I think there's a real danger that uh, the passions unleashed there would, uh, uh, could lead to hotting up the war, unfreezing the conflict, as we saw in, in uh, Georgia uh, five years ago. Um, the question of self-determination, um, Mr. <coughs> Havanasian quite rightly talked about the how the questions of self the principles of self determination of nations the principles of territorial integrity are not quite in the same field, um, but nevertheless they are both important um, issues that we have to have to deal with, and in practice self determination has been concerned with territories as much as with ethnic groups uh, in the context of Britain. We, it's uh, the people of Scotland have uh, are going to have a referendum in, in a couple of years, one year, to decide whether they want to be independent of the United Kingdom. But that's not a question about the uh, self determination of the ethnic Scots. It's about everyone who lives in that territory. And here, the problem in relation to Nagorno Karabakh is the uh, the problem of the uh, Azerbaijani population that is there, would they have a right to vote in, those, in that election? Um, the question of xenophobia that was referred to is very much connected with the refugee problem. Given that something like a quarter of the population of, of um, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was ethnically Azerbaijani and has gone to Azerbaijan, what is going to happen to them? The, their presence in Azerbaijan is making the uh, conflict uh, potentially sharper, and they will be the basis of a more a nationalistic uh, move in Azerbaijan if something happens to the Aliyevs. Um, finally, uh, the, I, I was very glad that uh, the speakers brought in the wider world, um, and this might come up in discussions as well, perhaps, the, um, as the, the roles played by Russia and the United States, European Union, BP, um, but it seems to me that the most important relationship that Armenia still has to sort out is over Turkey. And it, to an outsider, uh, the lack of progress on this is really what is holding things up much more than uh, anything else. And uh, there are absolutely two sides to this question who is responsible for the failure to uh, ratify the agreement that was made between Armenia and Turkey a couple of years ago. But if people don't get to work on that, then it's going to be much harder for Armenia to get out of its problems. 
So that's a very personal viewpoint, which <coughs> thank you for listening to me. I've really to now I'll just vacate the podium and uh, um, invite you all please to ask questions to any of our excellent speakers. Who's the first one? One, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, by, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned uh, Peter about um, uh, Scotland uh, in September next year, but more to the point, I think, uh, uh, is Malvinas Island or uh, um, I forget the English name. Sorry, I did forget. It's just controversial. <coughs> Falkland Islands. Uh, a couple of days before uh, the rise of white smoke from Sistine Chapel, we had another election in there, and, and uh, it's interesting what Mr. Cameron said, the Prime Minister of this country. And there, he didn't mince his words about the right of self-determination. There was no mention of territorial integrity, etc., etc., etc. Now, considering in the Falkland Islands, you have settler population that's been there only for, what, 100, 150 years, and we're talking about no more than 2,000 people or thereabouts. And considering in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, we're talking about people who've been there, according to all evidence, for thousands of years, if, if not longer, and, and we're talking about considerably larger number of people. Oh, is it the case that the Armenians are on to mensch, or they don't count, or the, 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 the fact that they've gone through all the processes and procedures of, uh, you know, uh, from right from 1990, democratically according to Soviet constitution, etc., etc., and then uh, the, the fact that Azerbaijan has actually unleashed aggressive wars and, and has lost them? I mean, where are we? Why are these double standards and, and, you know, making one rule for one group of people and another uh, for, 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 the, for the Armenians? This, uh, we, I could, we could extend it to South Sudan, we could uh, go to Kosovo, we could go to everywhere. I mean, what is it? Just because uh, the Baku uh, Hanet has got a few barrels, barrels of oil, we have to make exception for them, despite all the aggressive and hateful and really... Uh, racist, Nazi-type speeches that are coming down, which itself is very dangerous. Now, that brings me to my second question, which I'll be very brief, I promise. Now, given all this situation, given all the excellent speeches that our, 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 our speakers have made, given the fact that since 1994 we've had ceasefire, if not peace, but ceasefire, uh, now, is, wouldn't it be dangerous, really, truly dangerous, to, to come back to the speech that you and uh, Mr. Giragosian made about unleashing war because of mistakes or, or de by default? Now, given that we've had the, the, this peace situation as things stand, how could we even consider making territorial concessions to this sort of a regime, which considers Armenians truly not just untermesh but uh, dispensable, and, and it says every, et cetera, et cetera. Giving uh, any, any territorial concession to this sort of regime, given that it's armed to the teeth, will it not then use these, these territories to unleash the very thing that we've been trying to avoid and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, we've been successfully avoiding, i.e. the ceasefire situation? So I'm, I'm afraid, as, as, as an observer, not just as an Armenian, but as an observer, I would say, uh, the, the current uh, status, the current situation is far more preferable <coughs> to any, any progress in inverted commas if it involves uh, territorial concessions to such an aggressive uh, pan-Turkist uh, uh, racist regime. Thank you very much. Next question. Or would any, sorry, would any of you like to respond at this stage? And well, take a comment. Nobody is going to give them something. To <laughs> be secure of that. I hope so. That's <laughs> well. I didn't think it as a really required a response, but that, thank you. Yes, I'll, yes. I'll just ask uh, another question, returning back to Mr. Rovanesian's mm -hmm. statement. The uh, first time I heard Mr. Rovanesian was in 1993, back here at Yerevan State University. And then uh, we had another chance, uh, and we met again when Mr. Rovanesian was in power, uh, part of coalition. We never met when I was in jail. We <laughs> 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 met before that, actually. <laughs> It was Tatum Kerpeyan's second anniversary, so yeah, so we met the first time there. What I'm trying to say is not that how many times we met, but that uh, how many times I've heard you with the same opinion and same understanding that this country, first of all, needs to be democratized. First of all, we need to look at ourselves and be more critical of who we are and where we could be in the contrary to what we are comparing ourselves to Azerbaijan or to any other country. There was a time when we were in the same league with Georgia in our democratic reforms and things. Now I work on uh, rule of law, <coughs> democracy, and criminal justice reform in former Soviet nine countries. 
including Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and I never see the same zeal and the uh, same kind of willingness from Armenian authorities to go to the path of reforms as I can see in Ukraine, even Kazakhstan. So things are, in, I think, I, I, for us, for Armenians, I see more problem in there. As a former commander, commander of a company in Nagorno-Karabakh Defense Army, I now see only few of my friends are in Armenia. Most of them are outside. So I don't say that there are no other people who could stand and defend. There are plenty of them, but this is, this, we need to get rid of these demotivating factors for, our, for us. We need to create a democratic state which would be which would motivate for all of us to get back and put our potential to the well-being of this country. Well, saying all this, coming to the question, knowing Dashnak Tsitsun and being in third generation of sympathizers of the uh, party, I would like you as a politician to outline your view and your understanding of how we move to better and democratic Armenia. <coughs> First of all, uh, I would like to stress that I fully agree with Mr. Duncan when he says about the dangers of democratization, which is paradoxical, but there are such dangers. For example, see what's happening in Azerbaijan. Because they became uh, members of different uh, uh, international organizations such as OSCE or Council of Europe or so on, they uh, started implementing, or at least visibly in implementing, some uh, democratic uh, changes in their country, some democratic rules. And they pretend to play uh, the competitive democracy in their country, elections, which are not elections at <coughs> all. It cannot be compared with anything in former Soviet Union, even, okay, name in the country. But what's happening? Because they pretend to compete, they have to compete. They have to say something different from uh, what is said by their uh, opponents. What is their thing? They cannot <coughs> openly criticize anything important. So the only matter which can be uh, a topic of discussion is Nagorno-Karabakh. So they compete in aggressiveness. And that I observed for 20 years already. They compete, compete in aggressiveness. Opposition say, uh, these guys sold Karabakh, I mean Aliyev's clan. Uh, we have to put them out of power. Uh, Aliyev's clan says, no, these guys sold Kelbajar and they were uh, the main reason for our uh, defeat, and both sides are right, but uh, that, that's another matter. Uh, and and that, as a result, they found themselves competing, <coughs> competing. After election, you have to answer. You promised. You promised that I will be in power and I will uh, cut the, the throats of these Armenians. I will break their uh, bones and so on, so on. And now they found. Uh, themselves in a situation where this democratic pretension led them to a very aggressive rhetorics which they cannot avoid already. But in our case, in our case, I think the uh, second point, uh, I, I will also try to be short. Uh, I'm a vice president of Euronest Parliamentary Assembly, which is a new organization created two years ago, it's a parliamentary dimension of Eastern Partnership of the European Union. 60 parliamentarians from the European Union and the same uh, than 60 from the East. 10 are out because Belarus is out, 50. And uh, I'm vice president of this parliamentary assembly. And now only our European friends start to understand that when they put some goal which must be achieved by Eastern partners, not all of them are able to cross the bridge with the same speed. Obstacles are different. 
uh, hindrances, difficulties are different. So Europe, Americans, or the world must come, must uh, find a new criteria of evaluation. Which country, which society puts more effort to reach the same goal? And when you uh, see it from that perspective, Armenia's efforts are much more than we achieved. You are here right. But that does not mean that efforts are not done. You can compare our elections. I am opposition, and I hate our elections. I have... Uh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you understood. You understood what I mean. Uh, but when I compare it with what's happening around, uh, I understand that efforts of our society are alive, yet vivid and alive. But what we can do? I think we in Armenia already are fed up by very strong presidential, pyramidal uh, power. We have to change it, make disperse the power, make it more uh, decentralized, and go to the presidential <coughs> republic. Parliamentary. Uh, parliamentary republic, excuse me. To the parliamentary republic. It is difficult now to uh, <coughs> explain and describe all the details of such a move, but I think this is inevitable already. Thank you. Would either of you like to comment on that? It's really interesting to address to Mr. Hess. Yeah. Uh, the next question, please. Uh, ah, please. Uh, we've seen, seen in the past week was the ceasefire uh, in Turkey with the PKK, and of course with the uh, gradual reconciliation with Israel. It, then there may be a uh, probability they might join the EU. If that were to happen, Armenia would literally be on the EU's borders. Would that have any effect with the Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh issue? That's what comment. Okay, we'll never be part of it. Point. May I uh, very shortly? Uh, Turkey registered serious progress, I think, in its diplomatic uh, efforts. Where uh, that will lead uh, remains to be seen. But the European Union is not economic bloc. It is not military bloc. It is already well forgotten, but European Union was created around values. So either they accept Turkey as a newly emerging European mind new country, or they close their eyes that Turkey <coughs> is the same Turkey as for 400 years, and take uh, it inside only because of some political uh, calculations, then uh, European Union will deteriorate as a, as a uh, preserver of that values. And then what will be behind the Armenian border will be already not the same European Union. So nothing good can be expected of that neighborhood. Let me add one <coughs> further clarification on this. What's actually interesting in this context is not the EU in Turkey as much as the EU in Armenia. Armenia is now in the process of negotiating two important developments, a deeper and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union and an association agreement with the EU. Ironically, for the past eight months, Armenian progress with the European Union has far outpaced Turkey. In other words, Armenia now has more of a unique chance to even overcome the obstacle of Turkey. And most recently, we have a French supermarket chain coming to Armenia called Carrefour. Is it coming? It is now coming, it's official. Uh, the reason this is important is not to buy the fancy cheese. I'm American, it doesn't really get me. <laughs> but the reason I'm excited is the missing ingredient in Armenia, competition. In other words, the best way to confront the dwarfs of the oligarchs of Armenia, uh, 
well, we can go on about that, and we will. But the reason Carrefour, the EU, is such an important opportunity is both strategic and tactical. Strategic because it gives Armenia a chance to overcome isolation and engage in not just the globalized market, but the West, rather than simply Eurasian Union and Russia's pet projects. But also tactically, it's the way to introduce competition to destroy the cancer of the oligarch system within Armenia. And I forgot we're on camera. Okay. But seriously, this is an important issue to raise. Thank you. Um, I believe, uh, is there anyone else? Sorry, the, oh, before sorry. you asked, well, I'm sorry. Is there, is there anyone else? Or corrections. Feel free to. Yes, good. Yes, argue. corrections and criticisms. And, oh, please. Thank you. I am student here at UCL, and uh, I'm writing my uh, master's dissertation on the topic of. Uh, uh, <coughs> Eastern Partnership, uh, the new dimension of uh, European Union and Armenia cooperation. So my question would be the following. Uh, does the European Union uh, have a role in the uh, conflict resolution process? Uh, and uh, uh, the second sub-question would be, uh, what's the current situation? Uh, uh, in the sphere of like uh, European Union foreign policy towards Armenia and European Union foreign policy towards Nagorno-Karabakh, if any. Thank you in advance. Thank you. Please. Let's take this first, if you don't mind. What's most interesting, <laughs> I mean, I've been with our think tank working closely with the Swedes in the polls, specifically. Carl Bildt, the foreign minister of Sweden, notably, in terms of the main architects and engines behind the Eastern Partnership. What we're trying to do is actually not replace the OSCE as the mediator over Nagorno-Karabakh, but to actually complement and supplement or strengthen the mediation by engaging the actors involved, by broadening the scale and scope of the mediation. More specifically, we want to take the working group within the OSCE that's empowered to negotiate the peace process, the so-called MINS group, we want to make it much less Minsk and more group. In other words, less Minsk-style secrecy, authoritarian, closed-door decisions, and much more group in terms of engaging all actors and all parties to the conflict. And yes, I mean Felix, too. In other words, bringing Nagorno-Karabakh in as much as the EU engaging. For example, the European Union... <coughs> needs to no longer wait for permission from Azerbaijan to visit the region. And to quote Carl Bildt, in one statement he captured the essence of the challenge and the imperative. Nagorno-Karabakh, in his words, is the only conflict in wider Europe where the EU has no role to play whatsoever. It's wrong, it's dangerous, and it needs to be fixed. The other reason is the view from Washington. To be honest, <coughs> the U.S. has no policy regarding the Caucasus. It's a subset of U.S.-Russian relations, and it's a byproduct of Iran and Turkey. The U.S. is actually withdrawing from the region, but they are looking for the EU to fill the vacuum. And from an Armenian perspective, EU engagement is less toxic and less provocative to the Russians than NATO enlargement, which is over, or U.S involvement. So in this case, Armenia can actually leverage its stability and actually build on the opportunities for greater EU engagement. And for Nagorno-Karabakh, it offers a new opportunity to actually graduate beyond Armenia's diplomatic monopoly or Azerbaijan's creative fiction about denying the existence of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. Thank you. Uh, let me just add that European Union finances uh, projects on the on confidence building measures and mainly on the second track, track diplomacy. And if I'm not mistaken, they have already provided about six million euros for two years projects. So it's very much soft power rather than trying to okay. clean this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, would you like that? No, no. Thank you. Um, one and then two, please. Uh, hi, uh, I'm from Albania. I'm quite sensitive to your issue. I'd like to say, though, it seems to me like a lack of deficiency in the bargaining power here. I mean, 
he all said, when we try to approach Azerbaijan, they don't like us. They say this, or they take their approach. And then you went on and you said that the European Union should lend power to this <coughs> diplomatic issue. Why should the European Union step in? Why shouldn't just Armenia find the powers to work and bring Azerbaijan in the table, even though they don't, they don't want to? Why should you need lending power from the USA or from any other country? Why can't you just, I mean, find that bargaining tool that brings them in the table? Let me take this quickly. It's a very good question, not just because it's Albanian and it's something, <laughs> an objective view, but what's important <clears throat> here is there's two answers why that I would argue. The first is the asymmetry of power, where Armenia militarily is stronger, more democratic, yes. Weaker demographically, two of its four borders are closed, we're landlocked, and we have no oil. In my opinion, thank God we have no oil. <laughs> but the reason is the second reason. We need to actually engage the EU specifically because <clears throat> both Azerbaijan and Armenia are in the process of Eastern Partnership. In other words, it gives Armenia a greater degree of leverage in terms of challenging Azerbaijan's lip service to the West and to Western standards. And finally, what's important is we do need to take your idea and recommendation. Because from an Armenian perspective, what we really need to do is to understand that Azerbaijan must save face. We must be able to craft and create a graceful exit for Azerbaijan to be able to let go of Nagorno-Karabakh. And in earlier presentations this week, Mr. Hovhannisyan has been strongly articulating the need not to humiliate Azerbaijan. And this is also important. And to be honest, from my perspective, as a diasporan Armenian who moved to Armenia, I actually am no longer satisfied with measuring progress in Armenia out of a contrast with Azerbaijan. I'm no longer satisfied to say, oh, we're not fully democratic, but we're so much better than Azerbaijan. We should have less tolerance for that. We need to apply Armenian metrics, our own benchmarks of progress to Armenia, economic development, democracy, based on what we expect from our government in Armenia, and not out of comparison to Azerbaijan. And moreover, we need to understand that, from an Armenian perspective, we have a higher level of expectations and threshold of our own governments. And in many ways, the impetus or the challenge is shared in this room. It's up to us, within Armenia, to confront an arrogance of power. And it's up to you, those from Armenia, to actually maintain pressure from the outside. And no longer should we be satisfied with daring to criticize or challenge Armenian politicians or leaders in power because we fear that we're strengthening the enemy. No, we need to actually demand more conditionality for aid, for assistance from the diaspora and from Armenia. We need to actually demand greater performance. And to date, there's a reason Mr. Hovhannisyan and his party is in the opposition. To date, the arrogance of power entrenched corruption have reached such endemic proportions, systemically, that it's simply no longer acceptable. I'd like to add, add uh, a few words to uh, See, uh, <coughs> when I hear, for example, Azerbaijani politicians, and I, am, uh, I hear them often enough, because they have also representation in the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly, their main uh, task there, the duty which is given in Baku when they are sending them, is to explain to Europeans why they cannot be democratic. Because there is Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, because Armenians are bad neighbors, because they have problems, frozen conflict, and so on. Armenia never uses, never uh, have used the, uh, the pretext of conflict for, uh, as an uh, imaginary obstacle to democratic reforms. We have, uh, Armenia has 
its own reasons uh, why our democratic reforms are so slow. And Mr. Kirakosian mentioned some of them, corruption, oligarchs, and so on. But never we use the pretext of conflict. So for us, it is very favorable, uh, you know, atmosphere. When uh, the main goal which gathered us in Euronest is democratization of our countries and reaching democratic standards for uh, European integration, accession, and so on. In this race, this race is peaceful race, not like arm race. And in this race, we have chance to win and make the peaceful uh, solution uh, more partadir. Compulsory. Compulsory for Azerbaijan. Thank you. Please. Uh, I would like to, to add some words from the perspective of Nagorno Karabakh, of course. Uh, I think that uh, there is a role, uh, international, not only the European Union, but international community to play. And it is uh, the in, maybe engagement of Nagorno Karabakh in the international processes. Because it will, we, we believe that it will help. To, uh, to overcome, the, to, to go beyond the current situation in the settlement process towards more prosperous and secure future. Thank you. Please. Uh, yes, well, one, one thing that I find missing is, uh, uh, in a way, Russia. I mean, you're all talking about the European Union, West, uh, this and that, but one feeling is that this is all Russia's backyard, and the events in Georgia proved it uh, beyond any doubt that the, 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 first, the people who really called the shots are the Russians. I'm just wondering how much real room for maneuver does Armenia have? Whether whatever they do, whatever they decide for war and peace at the end of it, it's Russia really that decides what's going to happen in that region. Thank you. I think you somewhat overestimate. Russia's power. Uh, exactly as Mr. Duncan mentioned in 1988, Armenian huge demonstrations were the first signal that uh, Moscow is not as powerful as before. Today, I have a feeling that we can exercise our own independence in, in the in the frame of our national interests. Our, most, our most difficult problem is not Russia. Uh, it is uh, to define our national interests. If we do that, and if we didn't mistake in doing that, then I think such obstacles, are, uh, as mentioned by you, will be not uh, longer obstacles, because we have very good relations with Russia, and we will have very good relations, but we have to change their um, uh, capacity, that their, uh, um, I, 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 it is difficult to find the word, nuances in, in, in this, uh, we are already started changing. I'm sorry, I didn't claim <coughs> that this was a problem I don't see this as a problem. On the contrary, I feel more secure that uh, Russia is there to protect us. Uh, well, <laughs> let me continue this a little bit because um, <coughs> no, I'm not an expert on anything. I'm an analyst, so I could be very wrong. But my opinion is slightly different in that <coughs> the relationship between Armenia and Russia is probably necessary. It's required. It's the imbalance or asymmetry of the relationship that bothers me. Armenia's strategic mistake for too long has been to, for Armenia to grossly underestimate Armenia's strategic value to Russia and to overestimate Russia's value to Armenia. In fact, Nagorno-Karabakh is the confirmation. In other words, the victory over Nagorno-Karabakh was despite Russia, not because of Russia. And in many ways, Russia has been treating Armenia little more than a garrison state in terms of its military base, in terms of 
is a acquisition of key sectors of the economy. <coughs> Armenia has dangerously been mortgaging its sovereignty and independence for too long. But what's interesting, over the past several years, Armenia is deepening ties with NATO, with West in uh, nation states, in terms of military security, regaining balance. Also, getting more from Moscow because of its deepening Western orientation. So I think, in other words, even politically, it's no longer pro-Russian versus pro-American. What we don't have enough of is the pro-Armenian politicians, like Mr. Hovhannisyan, who need to actually raise the level of discourse and debate to start thinking and defining what kind of Armenia will we leave for the next generation. There's not enough of that strategic vision. But to be honest, it's a reality that the United States, even the European Union, is far away from Armenia and always will be. Russia is very close and always will be. So even I, from a more American Armenian perspective, recognize the need for a relationship between Armenia and Russia. But we need in Armenia to demand more respect from this Putin's Moscow in terms of Armenia being the only reliable ally of Russia in the region, the only member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And I'm sorry, this Eurasian Union, it's neither the first nor the last time we've heard this. It's empty. But we need to build greater self-sufficiency in Armenia rather than relying on any foreign promises, whether Russian or American. In fact, in history, whether it's Woodrow Wilson or other foreign promises from Moscow, whenever Armenia, as a state or nation, believed the foreign promises, the result was always pogrom or genocide or massacre. I think we finally learned our lesson. Thank you. And did you want to come yeah. uh, I, I would like just to add that uh, Russian Federation is one of the co-chair co countries, or the Minsk Group co-chair countries together with the United States and France. And the, the current mediating format, I mean these three co-chair countries, uh, it serves very well in precluding the worst scenario of scenarios of new use of military force. And the ability of the co-chairs to engage with with all side and to communicate the signals, concerns explicitly and implicitly is a very important uh, factor for peace. But at the same time, Russia has now emerged as the number one arms <coughs> provider to Azerbaijan. It's something Armenia should take more seriously. Thank you. Well, we've got seven minutes, le six minutes left. Um, there were two people who wanted to ask questions, so I'm going to ask them both to ask and then see, uh, ask the speakers to answer briefly. So I think you were first, and then, yeah, please. I think you were first, and then. Uh, no, I just have a comment, so let the yeah. gentleman to ask his question. Uh, I think more important, maybe in, in some respects, than, than Russian influence, and I agree with everything that Dr. Gilkonsian said, we shouldn't be just trusting of Russia. And historically, ever since the 17th, 18th century, from Peter Grace on to present, the dealings with Baku, uh, arms sales, etc., and Turkey. When the time comes, whether it's Woodrow Wilson or, or Moscow, whatever, they, they, they're, they're, their number one comes first, and they, they always sell Armenia's interests. We have to be very careful. Having said that, obviously Russia is very important for Armenia's security, if for no other reason than Turkey's uh, neo-Ottoman inspirations and aspirations in the region. I think we have to be very careful about it. Uh, uh, new Islamist... Uh, not so democratic Turkey, and I don't believe Turkey will ever be part of, well, ever, it's maybe, maybe in the year 4000, but uh, given the, uh, you know, uh, new, new uh, Ottomanist, uh, Islamist inspiration, given what is happening in the region, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, uh, I, I know, for example, Mr. Hovhannisyan's party, the Dashnaks, left the coalition over the protocols and the football di diplomacy situation, where obviously the, the main factor there in, in, in not realizing the protocols was Turkey's insistence in meddling into uh, the affairs of Nagorno-Karabakh situation and making Nagorno-Karabakh deal part of this protocol situation, which obviously Europe, America, and everybody else said, you know, it's not acceptable. But overall, I think we have to be, Armenia has to be very, very wary of, of uh, neo-Ottoman inspiration and, and the noises coming from Ankara. We have to be very careful. If we don't get our system right, we could be another Cyprus for Turkey. I mean, obviously, they just marched in. There's nothing stopping them from because they've done this historically. 
we have to rely on our forces, but uh, alliances with Moscow and European <coughs> Union and factors to stop Turkey from making this sort of aggressive moves and interfering in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, um, peace process is very, very important. Thank you, Dr. Anna. I gather from Russia we have two questions from the wider world. And you have your comments as well? Sure. Yes. Uh, so, do I have those two questions in your comments? Yeah? Yep. And then I'll ask you uh, uh, in the last four we minutes. We have uh, two questions from our online audience. So, one is from Bucharest, Romania. Uh, regarding to the recent elections, and it is addressed to Mr. Juan Havanesian. So the question is the following. Uh, recently, in the statements of different political powers in Armenia, mainly oppositional ones, uh, we saw the speculations on recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic by Republic of Armenia. Uh, President Sarkisian called it a mistake. Uh, what is your opinion on this, considering that the time doesn't work on us? And you are an oppositional. And the second question is addressed to oh, okay. Mr. Felix Khachatrian. It is uh, concerned um, Stefan Akirte report. So, what is the real cause why still we do not open the airport in Stefan Akirte? Because all the answers by the Karabakh side are mainly uh, <coughs> related to the technical issues. So. Thank you. And, would, and your comments? No, no, okay. So, um, two questions I will there, very please. Uh, <coughs> uh, my party, uh, in this uh, matter, recognizing, officially recognizing uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Republic as a state, was always uh, very cautious. It is now to maybe different reasons, not the same, not the absolutely the same as the president's reasons. We think that uh, that will give us nothing at the moment. That's the last resort. But from the other side, we think that uh, Armenia must, and we uh, proposed this to the parliament, but unfortunately parliament uh, failed to vote for that. We proposed an agreement between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, not recognition, but an agreement of uh, support in any need, and uh, that was called very innocently Azerbaijani uh, responsibility for military aggression, something like that. So we can do that, that, that we can do that effectively without calling it some scandalous terms like recognition and so on. Why? We don't <coughs> need that now. But we can do that. We can reach the same goals as recognition by other means. At least now, this will be more wise. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. The, the airport. Uh, yeah, uh, I, first of all, I would like to reiterate that the rehabilitation of the airport issue pursues the sole civilian humanitarian purposes, and to, including the realization of such uh, human rights, such a freedom of movement, and uh, which is which is also uh, uh, was has been also undermined by the policy of Azerbaijan aimed at the isolation of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, concerning the, the opening of it. it, it Actually, yes, there is a technical issue to be fixed before the opening of, this, of the airport. And we, we, uh, I hope that it will be fixed soon and we will soon open. It's the secret missile defense plan. <laughs> but, uh, but I would like, by the way, to, 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 to very general, very general uh, observation on the first, first question that was addressed to Mr. Owens and just to add some, some words. Of course, it will not be correct from my side to, to comment the, the, the position of Armenia, but I would like just to say that we believe that there is a consensus in Armenia, in the Armenian politics, that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh should have a secure future, and its, its freedom may not be compromised. Uh, this goal, this goal unites everyone in Armenia. But of course, there may be different approaches and how to, to accomplish, how to reach this. We, we heard one of them from Mr. Rowanisian, they may be different. A good diplomatic answer. <laughs> Thank you. A good diplomatic <laughs> answer. So, uh, uh, only, only one short <laughs> remark about that matter. Can you imagine if, for example, Armenia uh, <coughs> official, may, uh, makes official statement and recognizes Nagorno-Karabakh? Not only the Azerbaijanis, but also all over the world, uh, 
question will arise. Ah, guys, so before that, you didn't recognize it. For us, it's established state uh, with all uh, effective working uh, institutions. So we don't need dramatic moves in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, we oh. do we have to go? It's half past eight. Yeah. Uh, we still can go. Oh, there were can we? Yeah. Two brief questions. Oh, can we? Great. Oh, good. I've been allowed to. Please. We can take both, but not at the same time, though. Um, Lady first. Thank you very much for all the speakers uh, for this informative uh, evening. I have a question. I missed the first, unfortunately, the first 10 minutes. I just wanted to know, uh, first of all, uh, what is the future for these uh, friendship groups that is starting in, in different <coughs> countries in Europe with Artsakh? Uh, there, what is the progress? So where is that leading to? Because there have been recent, uh, the recent progress has been in the, the friendship groups starting in different countries from Lithuania, I think France followed. Uh, what is the implication of that for our talk? That's my first question. And the second uh, observation is that uh, uh, the South Caucasus has become such an interesting area strategically that not only regional powers are involved, but all, you know, most uh, main major powers of the world is involved. And I think we can use that to utilize for our own national interest, uh, for our self-interest and for our new interest. So I just wanted to see where is this uh, friendship group going to lead us to. Thank you very much. And the gentleman behind. Yeah. Thank you. So one of the static hypotheses you're doing in your analysis is basically that the Armenian military poor is stronger than the others, which perhaps brings the Aliyev clan to be more reluctant for an immediate open war. But isn't the asymmetrical incomes mainly due to petrodollars and the asymmetrical investment in the military development? Uh, isn't all this playing against, I mean, isn't time playing against us in a way? And also, as perhaps you know, some years ago, uh, Baku opened a trading house in Geneva in order perhaps to shift slowly their uh, physical trading income into financial trading income in order to sustain their revenue from these petrol dollars, if you can call it like this. So my main question, perhaps, aren't they like in a very frozen position now in order to, to have the time for them? Thank you very much, Richard. Let me take this last question first as a, as a military analyst. What we see is you're quite right, but not yet. In other words, what's more important is not the amount of money that Azerbaijan is spending in defense. What's more indicative is analyzing where the money goes and how it's used. And until today, the last time I checked before entering the room, it's still the center of corruption in Azerbaijan. The Ministry of Defense and the Armed Forces is still prevented from actually living up to its potential because the defense minister of Azerbaijan is a very interesting figure. He's the longest serving defense minister in the world, second only to Raul Castro. <laughs> and it's based on loyalty and corruption, not competence. But when and if that defense minister is removed, that will be the bellwether, the indication that Azerbaijan will begin serious defense reform. Militarily, our assessments in terms of modeling show that if Azerbaijan embarks on serious defense reform today, over an eight to ten year period, they are capable of overtaking Armenia. But that infers a static measurement. That infers that Armenia doesn't take comparable steps. Armenia has a tremendous advantage defensively in terms of topography, force posture, readiness, training, and Armenia resembles more Israel in terms of using geography to its advantage in defense and a reliance on special forces, rapid response, rather than in other words, Azerbaijan in many ways is preparing to fight the last war. 
or even Napoleon. Trench World War I warfare, if you will. Whereas Armenia is already preparing and training for the next war. But if Azer decides to take back the, the Harabakh, what is the international legal position of Armenia to intervene? Because no, we are not no. Yeah, but this. my point is this: in terms of military reality, international law, even treaty obligations, really don't matter. The, the important reality is who controls what on the ground. Armenia's defensive positions are enough of an advantage. If Azerbaijan was to go to war today, even it knows it will lose, full stop. But in terms of security guarantees, etc., you'll notice Azerbaijan has been widening the attacks against Armenia proper, the northern Tabush region, where unfortunately they fired upon kindergartens, ambulances, which from my point of view is actually a disgrace to those in uniform. And, well, I'll stop here and give it to Mr. Ovenusin. Uh, you know, uh, last I heard, the military boots in Azerbaijan uh, can be sold here in Harrods, you know, because uh, the prices of their military goods are so high that that's a result of corruption. So, uh, I think we have time, but you're, uh, you are right that uh, time can one day start working against us. That day is not yet come, but it can. And the friendship society question. Ah, yeah. Friendship. When does Felix start? I was in, I was in, when first such a uh, friendship group was created in Lithuania, I was there, I participated uh, and uh, made a hot speech, after which we, we were waiting that three, four people will join, but 11 joined. One now left the group because uh, absolutely hysterical and fierce response, fierce reaction from Azerbaijani side. But I think we will continue that because when we speak about the recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh, and I told you already that we don't need <coughs> dramatic moves, last resort moves like Armenia recognizes Nagorno-Karabakh, Turkey recognized Northern Cyprus, so what? So what? So uh, for us, it's more important that some small city in, for example, United Kingdom, or in Lithuania, or in France, or in Uruguay, I don't know where, uh, sign some agreement about cultural uh, exchanges with some small town in Nagorno-Karabakh. When people uh, go as tourists, when, uh, for example, you heard last year the president of the parliament of Uruguay, Jorge Orico, with the delegation of all the political parties represented in Uruguayan parliament went to Nagorno-Karabakh and did it in the car with Uruguayan flag. So it was official visit. Such things are much more important. And of course, creating of such groups is very important. For example, we can create a friendship groups not of the big countries, but small cities, even small cities, councils uh, for uh, regions or cities, if they start uh, the process of recognizing Nagorno-Karabakh. Even in uh, uh, even in different ways, cultural education, cooperation, and so on. That will be enough because what recognition means? Recognitions, recognition means uh, existence, and we need exactly that now. <coughs> and very, very shortly, yeah, I would like to, to add that yeah, yeah, I agree fully with that. Uh, it, it, it was a very important uh, initiative, started in Lithuania and then continued in France. Uh, it is important because it, uh, it demonstrates that the policy of Azerbaijan aimed at imposing isolation uh, on, uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh, to, uh, to aim at isolation of Nagorno-Karabakh is fate to failure. And it is very, very important. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. Um, the reason I was getting it. Sorry, have we got. There's, uh, there's one more question. Can no, we take no, 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 we do not have. Sorry. Yeah. We don't. We have to leave. We have to stop doing it. Uh, sorry, Mike. Right. Discrimination. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's won't.
And the last one, okay, I think we can. Uh, can, can I do that, Ashok? Yes, there is another one, last one. Like We, we are filtering the questions. Yeah, so we yeah, have the last one. Thank you. And then we'll see. Yes, thank you. Was it over there? Uh, yeah, uh, my question to Mr. Romanisian and Mr. Kyrgyzian is related to the latest, uh, like a couple of years ago, they ex like we extended the uh, uh, agreement for a Russian military base for up to. We didn't do it. Is it really like a real threat from Turkey to have this military base in, in Armenia? And like, uh, and I have second very small question to please, Mr. guys. Roger. No, no, please stick to one question. We really do not have time. Really, we do not have time. Please, only one question. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. We have to go. Uh, sorry. sorry. I didn't ask you. Again, you can take some questions. Very shortly. Uh, no, 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 no. Is another so question. Have we got time for this? No, we have time. Like, yeah, uh, we'll have, so we'll have that question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have that one question. We'll have that one question and then we'll have to go. I'm afraid. So, you we'll have yours uh, on the internet. One question so. from Berlin. Berlin. <laughs> The vitality of economic factors has become increasingly palpable in the resolution of territorial conflict. In which ways will the recent trends in the economic development of Armenia impact the prospect of a peaceful resolution of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh? So, two very different questions. One on military base and um, one on economic development. Any? Uh, what? Uh, I already forgot. Base. See, uh, we have to consider the threats around Armenia, not only Turkey. It is very traditional way to think about Turkey as only threat. If something happens in Iran, for example, military strike against that country, that can mean that can be a bring a flow of huge uh, quantities of refugees towards Armenia and Azerbaijan. A threat. Uh, unwise politics in Syria brought to the situation when Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda, is not trapped in the uh, mountains of northern Pakistan and Afghanistan. It is already on the Mediterranean shores. It is already in the heart of bigger uh, Near East, and so that means on our borders too. Uh, so. Uh, Agreement between Turks and Kurds cannot be very uh, long-lasting. So it is also a situation around us which can develop in a very uh, difficult ways. And consider that a Russian base in Armenia, those who serve there are, many of them, big part of them, are ethnic Armenians. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. And let me disagree slightly. The problem with the Russian base is the insulting terms that were forced on Armenia. Not only in terms of the extension of the lease before it was expired, but more importantly, it's one of the few foreign military bases in the world where the host government not only doesn't receive rent in terms of a lease, but Armenia has to pay for the water, electricity, the dry cleaning, and other services of this Russian base. And, I'm sorry, that's just a, another example of the mortgaging of the national security and sovereignty of Armenia. Sorry, I should be looking at you, it was your question. Um, in terms of the economics, economic incentives regarding the Gorno Karabakh, in my opinion, are pretty empty. That's post-conflict resolution, where economic incentives come in. What we really lack is security guarantees. And, in fact, Nagorno-Karabakh erupted as a conflict because of the lack of security guarantees and Sumgait pogroms, Kirovabad, Baku, etc. What we really need is security before any, any real or false promises of economic incentives. Well, I, I'm very sorry I'd have to draw this to a close because um, we are running out of time, but can I... <coughs> And there's so much more to say about the whole process of peace and how it can be achieved, all the dangers that exist at the moment. But can I ask you to, well, first of all, can I thank you for coming out in this cold, really cold weather, and but to th join me in thanking all our excellent speakers for being here.